Welcome, my name is Cassandra and this is my classic arcade game collection. I can't wait to show you around, but first you might ask why or how I got started collecting these 250 pound monsters in the first place. I was born in 1972, the same year Atari would release the first truly successful arcade game Pong and set into motion the modern video game industry. Growing up in a household with a father who was an electronic engineer meant being surrounded by technology at a very early age. My childhood was filled with early home computers, game systems, electronic gadgets, and the occasional Heathkit electronics project being put together on the kitchen table. Summers were often spent in the beach community of Ocean City, Maryland with my grandparents. I don't particularly like the beach, but I do love arcades. So much of my summer would be spent here at Marty's Playland Arcade right on the boardwalk. Outside the summer months, I would occasionally get lucky and spend some time with various arcade games at the local Pizza Hut or 7-Eleven. I bought my first arcade game at a thrift store in 1994 for $50. It was a rather well-loved but fully working Nintendo Play Choice countertop. The following Christmas, my parents gifted to me an Atari Kangaroo Upright and the addiction had started. Like most collectors, my collection has grown and shrunk over the years again and again due to many factors such as moving and a divorce. Now, I'm happy to report thanks to a fantastic marriage and living in a location I don't plan on leaving anytime soon, I have amassed a collection of 30 classic arcade games. Despite having a decently large home, some games are unfortunately in the basement, but most of them do reside in two rooms in the main level of the house. Over the almost 30 years of collecting, I have gained some valuable skill sets in the realm of arcade game repair and restoration. I also consider myself to be a bit of an amateur historian for arcade history, and you can find many videos on arcade topics here on my YouTube channel or read about even more topics on my website. But for now, I invite you to come with me into our home arcade and I'll take you on a tour of all 30 of our games. The first game we're going to look at in the collection is Arkanoid by Tato. Arkanoid is a fun brickbuster style game that plays very much like a 1980s update of the Atari 1970s classic Breakout. Arkanoid was sold only as a conversion kit and it was a very popular one at that. Many classic arcade game cabinets would end up getting converted to Arkanoids in the mid 80s. Conversion kits were kits that arcade operators could buy to change a cabinet from its original title to a new title in hopes of making a no longer profitable game into a profitable one again. These kits often included a new game PCB artwork and sometimes new wiring or even unique controllers. Our example was originally a Miss Pac-Man and it has an artwork kit manufactured by Zabos Arcades, which you can still buy today. It's a fun game thanks to its somewhat more casual gameplay elements and a unique combining of the classic game breakout with power-ups that are normally found in spaced-themed shooting games. Asteroids Deluxe is the follow-up to the original Asteroids game, which had come out in 1979. Deluxe is a bit different than the original, but only in small ways. It has some better animations, it's more difficult, and it replaces the hyperspace function with a shield function. Our Asteroids Deluxe is a cocktail cabinet version. This type of cabinet was designed so people could sit down and play next to each other or across from each other. And these game cabinets were very popular in restaurant settings. This is also one of the five vector monitor arcade games in the collection. Now, if you don't know, vector monitors are unique in the way they draw the image on the screen compared to a more traditional raster style monitor. You can think of raster versus vector almost as a mini format wars in the early history of arcade games, kind of like the war of uh, VHS versus beta or maybe like Mac versus Windows. Vector monitors allow a very clean wireframe style graphic to be produced due to the unique way it handles both voltage and drawing from the center of the screen outwards. Vector graphics in the late 70s through early 80s was more effective doing some things better 
than raster due to limitations of the power of microprocessors, such as a somewhat more sophisticated animation, brighter colors sometimes, and effective pseudo 3D environments, which we'll see in some of the later games in the collection. Vector would unfortunately die out as a technology as raster graphics improved. Vector Monitor has also got a well-deserved reputation for being somewhat unreliable and sometimes difficult to fix. But Vector offers a unique experience that cannot be reproduced even today with more modern devices. Our Asteroids Deluxe came into the collection about three years ago and was non-working when it arrived. It went through a rather extensive restoration and is one of only two cocktail cabinet tables in the collection. This is maybe the biggest oddball in the whole collection. Batman Part 2 has really nothing to do with the Batman superhero, but is a rather poor bootlegger copy of the game Phoenix, which was released in the USA by Centuri and was a big hit for them. And now the graphics are a bit dodgy and the controls are very questionable and the sound effects can best be described as like an alarm clock. The game itself, hardware-wise, is based around bootleg Galaxian hardware technology, and there are several gameplay differences between this game and a legitimate Phoenix game. Thomas Atomatics, or TAI, was a small UK-based company that mostly made questionable gray market or bootleg games with a few exceptions. Any surviving TAI products are very rare, but recently I tracked down another countertop TAI machine that I hope to have in my collection soon. The cabinets are unique to Thomas Automatics and very well made for bootlegs. You can also check out my mini documentary on TAI here on YouTube, and it's the only countertop style arcade game in the whole collection. Battle Zone is another vector monitor classic from Atari, and our example here is housed in the harder to find, smaller cabaret style cabinet when we compare it to the more common, larger full size upright cabinet. Now, the cabaret version loses the plastic periscope front of the full size upright, but I dig the cabaret version more for some reason. The game went through a slight restoration about two years ago, and it can be a bit fussy sometimes, as most battle zone machines tend to be. Now, it's due for a rebuild of the controllers, which are somewhat unique to this game, but share some parts with some other Atari games, and I hope to get to that in the next few months. The vector monitor in this game is actually still just a black and white vector monitor, but it uses colored gels over top of the monitor to give the illusion of color. Battlezone was an innovative game creating an early sandbox style type play environment of gameplay in a pseudo 3D environment that today we take for granted with almost any modern game you could play on a home system. Battlezone is a true classic. Black Widow is a bit harder to find than most Atari titles from the early 80s. It's also a historically interesting game on several levels. First, it was released as a conversion kit for the 1982 Atari arcade title Gravatar. See, Gravatar had been a bit of a disappointment for both Atari and arcade owners over complaints about how difficult the game was and how player interest faded very quickly from both Gravatar and overall in space combat style games. Black Widow plays a lot like the Williams arcade game Robotron 2084, but instead of fighting off a horde of robots trying to kill the last human family, in Black Widow you play a spider attempting to fight off wave after wave of aggressive invading insects. It's a fast paced game with some fun ideas including bonus waves and the ability to skip levels at the start of the game. Black Widow uses a color vector monitor to create some strikingly beautiful animation and color rich graphics. Black Widow is a fun title that very few people outside of collecting arcade games really know much about. Centipede is a stone cold arcade classic and is one of those games that even over 40 years later people both enjoy and are aware of, even if they're not really into classic arcade games. Centipede was one of Atari's biggest hits and one of the few classic arcade games programmed by a woman 
Donna Bailey. Centipede came in three different cabinet styles, a cocktail cabinet, a full-size upright, and then there's ours, which is again a smaller cabaret style, which came complete with classic Atari wood grain sides. Our example is rather interesting since it was originally owned by Atari itself and used as a promotional sales tool for events before being sold at a discount to an operator. We've owned this game for about six years. We purchased it from a fellow collector while in Texas. Cloak and Dagger was originally titled Agent X, but was changed after a licensing deal was reached with Atari and Universal Pictures to tie the game in with the 1984 film starring Henry Thomas and Dabney Coleman. The game was released only as a conversion kit for game titles from Atari's competitor, Williams Electronics, and our example is a former Stargate cabinet. I completed this game project this year after collecting parts for it for over two years. If you're interested Interested, I recently made a video where I go into the history of the game with some depth and show off some more of the technical details of making the game. The game is a unique multi-directional shooter with a lot of depth and is not well known, I feel, outside of the arcade game collecting or playing community. The game dynamics remind me of a number of home computer games I used to play as a kid in the early 80s. It's too bad Cloak & Dagger isn't better known as a game since it's a lot of fun and one of my current favorites to actually play. Crystal Castles was my holy grail of collecting for almost the entirety of my participation in this hobby. And after owning it for about the last two years, I can say it still brings a smile to my face every time I look at it. It's a unique combination of a platformer and a maze game. Crystal Castles was innovative in its gameplay concepts and its beautiful isometric 3D-like graphics. Speaking of beautiful, I think the dedicated cabinet version we have here is probably the best looking arcade game cabinet of the classic era. Well, that's just my opinion, I guess. But the colors, the unique drop-down lighting from the marquee, along with the artwork inspired by MC Escher, really creates a statement of not anything at all. Crystal Castles is the high watermark of the original Atari, and it's a shame that only a year later, the company would be sold and broken up. This game was a literal barn find located a mere 15 minutes or so from Nintendo's USA headquarters here in the state of Washington. When we got it, it had been converted to a Super Mario Bros. Unisystem. It was in pretty rough condition. After an extensive restoration about a year and a half ago, it has now returned to its former glory. The early run of these games, or the red versions of the cabinet, are highly sought after by collectors, and this is a legitimate red cabinet, although not one that was originally a radar scan arcade game like some very early versions. If you're interested in the ins and outs of Donkey Kong cabinets and their variations, you can read my very long blog post on my website. I would love to track down a correct non-copyrighted version of the bezel for the machine, but otherwise the game looks and plays perfect to my eyes. I will admit, however, I'm not a huge fan of Donkey Kong as a game personally, but I know it's very important as far as the history of video games goes, and it's the cornerstone of the empire known as Nintendo today. This Donkey Kong Jr. is the only game in my collection that isn't running on completely original hardware, although I do have the original PCB in my collection and it is working. Currently it has a rather inexpensive 60-in-1 style PCB installed, but the cabinet itself is fully restored to the correct factory specs and appearance. It also has an LCD monitor, again the only one in my collection that currently has one of these monitors. All the other games have traditional vintage CRT style monitors. This was another Nintendo cabinet I bought, which was in terrible condition when I got it about three years ago and at some point I will reinstall the original monitor and the PCB but I like having the 16 in one board in the cabinet for parties so people have access to some of the classic games I may not have in my collection despite the somewhat dodgy emulation of those games on the 60 in one board. If someone asked me what the most underrated arcade game from the classic era was I might nominate Elevator Action. 
This run and gun platformer was innovative when it came out, and it's just as fun to play now almost 40 years later. Our version is a somewhat harder to find dedicated upright cabinet version of the game. It was mostly sold as a conversion kit in 1983. It's pretty much also all original. Tita Arcade games from this era can have a bit of a fussy power supply system, so I've changed out the power supply system with a more modern switching style one, but I still have all the original parts. This was one of the games I've been looking for for years, and I have a lot of fond memories of playing it at my local 7-Eleven uh, during my somewhat reckless youth, but it's a super fun game. We bought this game out of a funeral home's basement in Montana, proving you can never know where you might find classic arcade games lingering. There were also tags indicating this game had spent some time in an Aladdin's Castle arcade at some point in its life. Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters is a unique co-op playing isometric shooter with some RPG elements. Robot Monsters probably worked better as a home computer game than an arcade game, but nevertheless, it was sold mostly as a conversion kit. But our example is the dedicated cabinet version and is one of only 371 that were ever made. Adding to its uniqueness, it was also an early field test version of the game and includes a prototype marquee where one of the characters carries the name Link instead of Duke. I wonder if they changed the name due to the popular NES game character and game series. Atari Games used this style of cabinet for several games, but I really like the design of this cabinet, which includes an oversized marquee and a handy front sliding drawer for access to the PCB and power supply. We bought this game from a high-end collector in 2020, and it was the most expensive arcade game I've ever bought. It's a very rare game and a very unique one in the collection for sure. Our third and final Tito game is Jungle King and a somewhat harder to find cocktail version of the cabinet. When we first bought this game, it was kind of a mess. It had been converted into an elevator action. Tito cocktail cabinets are larger than most cocktail cabinets from other companies and originally featured uniquely designed glass tops, which can be hard to find. After I gave up trying to find a replacement top, I actually designed my own artwork for the top glass and ironically found an original replacement almost right after. But I left my creation installed since I like it a little bit better. Jungle King is a fun multi-stage platformer where you essentially play Tarzan. Tato was threatened with a lawsuit over the unauthorized use of Tarzan and ended up changing the name of the game to Jungle Hunt and changing the main character sprite to look more like a British explorer rather than Tarzan. Also missing from the legally approved version is the Tarzan yell at the start of the game. Jungle King was one of my childhood favorite games and it's a fun game to have in the collection now. Liberator was one of the lowest produced arcade games during the golden age for Atari, with less than 800 cabinets ever manufactured, all of them being dedicated uprights. Planned as the sequel to the popular game Missile Command and a tie-in with the popular comic book series Atari Force, Liberator seemed like a winner out of the gate. Unfortunately, it was not very well received and today is a rare footnote in arcade history. Our cabaret cabinet version was a scratch built version by us and we spent a good amount of time and effort to make it authentic as possible to what might have been if Atari had put the cabaret version into full production. After owning this game for a few years, I also think Liberator got a bit of a bum rap. It's a fun little shooter. It can get intense. In fact, I like Liberator so much, we currently have two of them. In the workshop, we have a Liberator Upright project purchased last year Really, just for the monitor and other various parts, I was shocked to discover after several days worth of finger-numbing paint removal, the original art for the game was almost completely intact and looked amazing. The historian in me just couldn't let a game like this not get a full, proper restoration. And right now, I have all the parts and pieces needed to make that happen. I don't plan on keeping this second Liberator when I'm done with it, so I hope to trade it to another collector for something in the future. If you're interested in the very rich and 
detailed history of Liberator, please check out my documentary on the game I made here on YouTube. It's one of the videos I'm the most proud of. Mikey is a fascinating game historically. It's the last game released by Centuri, who at one point was one of the bigger arcade game manufacturers in the USA, although originally it was designed by Konami. It's a platformer game with an almost open world field and a large variety of gameplay techniques for 1984. It also uses unlicensed music from the Beatles, which is a pretty brave move. It has a well-deserved reputation for being insanely difficult and punishing to play. Despite this, I love Mikey for some reason after finding it many years ago in an arcade emulation program, probably made. The cabinet itself was a former Red Alert game, which is sort of an early Space Invaders ripoff, but when I took possession of it a couple years ago, the cabinet had been turned into a pro wrestling game called Matt Mania, and I have a feeling it had been many, many other things in between there. Beyond just playing Mikey, this game has a six-way switcher, which is pretty handy. It allows me to play five other games on original or non-original hardware. Currently in the switcher is the excellent BitKit multi-game system, which also itself has over 20 games installed. Circus Charlie, which is another late released Centuri game developed by Konami. Toon Common, which was also released by Konami, but distributed here in the USA by Stern. There's another multi-game PCB in there. This time it's a Qbert J-Rock multi-game board, which also has several games. And finally in the last slot is another obscure Konami game released by Centuri, Locomotion, which is a fun and often overlooked puzzle game from the very early 1980s. Moon Patrol is a unique side-scrolling shooter classic released in the USA by Williams Electronics, but it was actually developed by the Japanese company Irem. It was very popular in the arcades and for home systems in the early 1980s thanks to its earwormy background music and innovative parallax scrolling. It was also one of the very first games that allowed a player to continue with additional credits. I bought this game about 15 years ago when I lived in Memphis, and it needs a total overhaul. The bottom of the cabinet is chipping, which is a common issue with Williams cabinets, and the interior wiring is honestly a complete basket case. The game works well currently, but I hope to restore it from head to toe in the next year. Now, you can make a pretty good argument that Miss Pac-Man is the most successful and most well-known arcade game of all time. Even 40 years after its initial release, Miss Pac-Man machines are still commonplace today in restaurants or bars. Taking a evolutionary step as a sequel to the original Pac-Man with slight game variations and tweaks, and the introduction of a female lead character was a masterstroke of marketing and gameplay that that the original Pac-Man creating team Namco had very little to do with. Our Miss Pac-Man machine is an unrestored survivor in average condition with typical wear and tear that these machines tend to have over time. Normally I have a Miss Pac PCB installed in the machine with the speed up option. It's just my preferred way I like to play it. But we also have additional variation PCBs of the game that we can install, including an original Pac-Man version. I'm not much of a high score chaser as far as arcade games go, but I will admit I'm pretty good at this game and my personal high score is a bit under half a million points. The Neo Geo multi-game system by SNK was an innovative and well thought out gaming system. It allowed operators to change game titles in the cabinet easily with large cartridges, almost just like a video game system. SNK also sold the system as a home system, but the price was fairly eye-watering, so it wasn't a huge success as a home system. The arcade version, however, was a big hit worldwide with a large catalog of game titles across multiple genres and interests. There are also many variations of cabinet styles, all with different capacities for the number of cartridges, but our version is a two-slot version which is fairly common. Loaded in our Neo Geo is a commonly used 160 one in one multi-game cartridge which is a bit of a bootleg cartridge but it does a pretty good job emulating many Neo Geo titles although it's far from perfect. 
Neo Geo cartridges themselves are highly collectible, making finding rare titles an expensive endeavor. I often get asked by those wanting to get into arcade game collecting where to start, and I always tell them to get a Neo Geo. These machines are affordable and offer a wide variety of games for everyone in the house, from shooters to fighters and some of the very best puzzle games ever made. Now, there are a lot of classic arcade game racers, but none of them have the legacy of fun vibes and great tunes like Sega's OutRun does. This cabaret cabinet version of the game was rescued from a storage locker of a bar in Dallas, Texas, and it went through a very extensive restoration literally down to bare wood and even four years after we did it i am still extremely satisfied how the game came out from the stencil side art to an all new reproduction control panel made from fiberglass our little outrun should be winning over new fans for decades to come outrun was one of a number of successful mid 1980s games from sega that used pseudo 3d like pixel scaling thanks to at the time the powerful Motorola 68000 processor. I remember seeing it in an arcade when I was a kid for the first time and it has remained one of my favorites. Pong is the very first Atari product and the first commercially successful arcade video game. You have to love how Pong looks with its groovy 1970s font and yellow bezel along with the wood grain sides on the cabinet. It also has a very cool minimalistic control set with very minimal instructions. Inside the cabinet, it's painfully simple with a black and white commercial television set, one PCB that has no microprocessor, no RAM or any ROM, and a legitimate loaf pan for baking to collect quarters. Out of all the games in our collection, this one might be the most special. It's a true living piece of history. It's even signed by the godfather of video games, Nolan Bushnell, who co-founded Atari. One of the most shocking aspects of Pong for me is despite its simplicity, is just how much fun it is to play even as it hits almost its 50th birthday. Some of this can be attributed to the great play dynamics and also that you have to play with somebody else since there's no one player option on Pong, making it a fun social experience as well. We bought this game about a year and a half ago and it was all in pieces uh, and 100% not working. And now it has a special place in the house living in my office, providing both fun Pong offs during lunch and a cool background for my Zoom meetings. Rally X is a racing maze game developed by Namco and has always lived in the shadow of its more famous Namco cousin that came out in the same year, Pac-Man. Rally X is a blast to play and in my opinion is just as fun as the original Pac-Man. The dedicated cabinet is pretty interesting with its groovy fonts, cool colors, and rat pink style inspired artwork. The cabinet itself is also a good bit smaller depth-wise compared to most upright cabinets of the era, and the design was used for another Bally Midway release Namco title, Bosconian, as well as very early runs of Galaga. Rally X isn't rare per se, but it is more difficult to find compared to most other games of the early 1980s, and our example is pretty solid and mostly original. The Simpsons is one of a series of four-player side-scrolling beat-em-ups from the very late 1980s through the mid-1990s from Konami. Over the last five years or so, these games have gathered a renewed interest with collectors thanks to their fun multiplayer experiences and their pop culture relevance. Our Simpsons has the honor of being the most elaborate restoration of any game in our collection so far. We bought it at auction about five years ago, and thanks to its rather poor condition at the time, we were forced to cut the game in half and rebuild the entire bottom of the game. Now, however, it's a beautiful example of a Simpsons game, and we have plans to add a six-way JAMA switcher with a custom harness to allow multiple Konami four-player PCBs to be added into the same cabinet, games such as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Sunset Riders. Simpsons may not have a lot of strategy in its play dynamics, but it's a blast when people come over to the house to play games. Our Space Harrier by Sega is special for several reasons. First, it's a classic pseudo 3D on the rails style shooter 
featuring some of the very best arcade game music ever made. Second, it's a harder to find stationary sit down version of the game when compared to the standard upright version. Last year, it also received a full restoration from top to bottom and overall, I'm pretty happy with how it came out. What really makes this space here so very special though, is it's the exact game I played on during summers as a kid visiting my grandparents in Ocean City, Maryland at the Playland Arcade on the boardwalk of Ocean City, a arcade that still exists to this day. I've owned this game for almost 25 years now, and it's a truly special one in the collection as far as warm, fuzzy memories of arcade games go. If you're interested in finding out more about the Space Area Restoration, you can check out my YouTube channel for a couple other videos on the subject. Smash TV is one part sequel to the Williams classic Robotron 2084, and another part homage to the Arnold Schwarzenegger film The Running Man. Gameplay centers around one or two player co-op action from a top-down perspective as players fight hordes of non-stop enemies in an attempt to collect cash prizes and a game show of the future complete with a psychotic host and even TV cameras. The game is full of tongue-in-cheek humor, gratuitous violence, and funny sound bites including some lifted phrases from another film, Robocop. Our version is the dedicated 25 inch monitor version, although a 19 inch version was also manufactured. The game is fully original and in very nice condition for its age. Many Smash TV game cabinets were converted to fighters during the early 90s and non-modified original games can be pretty tough to find today. Stargate was the sequel to the classic arcade game Defender with improved graphics and a few gameplay changes. Our Stargate is currently running on the Multi Williams PCB known as a J-Rock board. This PCB allows the player to choose from several different classic Williams games all in one cabinet on hardware that is essentially a carbon copy of the original for a seamless experience. The J-Rock system is a favorite with arcade collectors due to its variety of games and the authentic nature of its emulation of that original hardware. The control panel has also been changed for the setup, but we still have the original parts and pieces for the game if we ever wanted to change it back to just play Stargate. The cabinet itself is not in great condition and I plan on restoring it this coming summer. It suffers from a good bit of damage on the bottom and a bit of water damage on the top of the cabinet. Star Wars makes use of a classic movie tie-in and some of the very best wireframe vector graphics ever in an arcade game. Featuring a pseudo 3D cockpit viewpoint, you play Luke Skywalker and you replay some of the space battles and the attack on the Death Star from the original Star Wars film. I wasted a lot of quarters when I was a kid playing this game and I still think the game is a blast to play and a giant slice of feel good nostalgia. I bought this game, an upright version, from a fellow collector last year, and I've done a number of repairs on the technical end of the game to make it more reliable, but the cabinet at some point will probably need a full restoration, thanks to a number of holes and gouges. The holes someone drilled in the bottom of the game may be in an attempt to keep the internals of the game cabinet cooler. Regardless of the cabinet flaws, I'm very happy to have finally added this Vector Classic to the collection. The newest game to the collection, Super Pac-Man, was the first official sequel to Pac-Man, but the third released in the USA after Pac-Man and Mrs. Pac-Man. Super Pac is a fun game, but wasn't anywhere nearly as successful as either the original Pac-Man or Mrs. Pac-Man had been in the marketplace. Today's Super Pac is somewhat overlooked in the legacy of Pac-Man, and if you're interested in a bit of a deep dive on all things Super Pac, you can check out my recent YouTube video on the subject. The game was mostly original and is a title that has a pretty strong cult following in the arcade game collecting community. Tempest is another Atari classic and the last game of the five Vector arcade games we have in the collection to show you. 
It is also, without a doubt, the least reliable arcade game I have ever owned in my over 25 years of collecting. The color vector monitor produces some truly magical images for this fast-paced and innovative shooter. Adding to the uniqueness is the fun wedge-shaped design of the cabinet and a spinner to control your player. Our Tempest was purchased from a man in Texas about six years ago who had bought it originally out of a Chuck E. Cheese location in the mid-1980s. The cabinet is a bit rough. It evidently was dropped on its back at some point prior to our ownership. This last year, it received a very intensive monitor rebuild, so here's hoping it works with a little more consistency in the future. Tempest must have seemed like the future when it first arrived in arcades in the very early 80s. And despite modern technology, the game simply cannot be accurately reproduced. It's all thanks to the magic of a color vector monitor. Our last and final game is the Versus Super Mario Brothers arcade game. Now, the Versus system, or simply the Unisystem, was a series of games from Nintendo that all ran on the same PCB board system, but the games could easily be changed into different game titles with the change of a few ROM chips. The boards could actually power two different cabinets at the same time, and some dedicated Unisystem cabinets have two sides with two different monitors that allow either the same game title on both of the sides of the cabinet or two different games. Our example was a conversion from a Donkey Kong cabinet originally, although conversions from older Nintendo games are common for Unisystems, Nintendo also sold the system as a dedicated single, double, and double-sided cocktail cabinet. The game titles and hardware share a lot in common with the Nintendo Entertainment System home video game system with several interesting differences in gameplay on some of the titles. Our cabinet is configured with a switcher allowing up to six different games to be installed, although currently I only have three installed in the cabinet. Super Mario Brothers differs from the home version in both the difficulty and has some additional levels and some gameplay tweaks. The second game in our cabinet is the racing classic Excite Bike. The Versus version is a bit harder, has some slight gameplay tweaks, and a bonus round where you actually get to jump over buses like Evil Knievel. Finally, in the cabinet we have Castlevania, which in my opinion is one of the very best side-scrolling adventure games ever made. The Versus version of Castlevania is much more difficult than the home version. The level timer is a lot faster and when you get hit, it takes much more of your health bar away compared to the home version. There you have it, all 30 arcade games in the collection. So what will the future hold for the collection, you might ask? Well, I would imagine despite the current space limitations, more games will arrive in the arcade and a few might even leave. Although there are many titles that I'm interested in owning right now at the top of the list of desirability are probably a, a Tron, I would love to have Tron, uh, Pepper 2 would be a cool one to have, and also the skateboarding game 720. I also have a desire to scratch build a pack and pal cabinet as well as a multi tato cabinet at some point this year. I also have some eyes on adding a pinball machine which wouldn't be the first time I've had one in the collection I've had two previous pinball machines in the past, but for now, though I have a lot of projects to keep me busy and games to enjoy with family and friends, and the dream to hold on to that my Tempest won't break down more than once this year, um, you never know how the collection might evolve over time. Thanks for stopping by and checking out my classic arcade game collection, and again, if you're interested in more of deep dive of any of these things, check out the other videos here on my YouTube channel. Bye.